Hello, everyone. Can you see me? All right, so um, it's my great pleasure to be here. As I said in one of my comments, I'm sort of an outsider. I'm not actually a wisdom researcher yet, um, but I'm really enjoying this, this conversation so far. And um, you know, what I did to kind of launch my own inquiry into what I'd speak to you about is I did something probably pretty unwise. I decided to just go to the wiki page on wisdom and make a word cloud to see what would happen, what shows up, and it's kind of interesting, um, but not really. Um, <laughs> And what I uh, did in, you know, obviously subsequent thinking through this and reading some of the really uh, useful, helpful information on the, on the uh, Wisdom Research uh, website, is I'm starting to get a sense and learning about some of the key aspects that are being investigated right now and what qualities, what mental faculties are aspects of being wise or what, what entail, what are, what's entailed in wisdom. So being discerning, aware, virtuous, reflective, insightful. And I think some of these scales that we've been talking about would be really, have been very, uh, I mean, I'm keen to use them in some of my own work, let's just put it that way. So what I'm gonna tell you about is, is my kind of window into this, which is that attention may be key to many of the aspects of qualities that are part of wisdom. And my research in my own lab, I'm, I'm an attention researcher. I'm a neuroscientist who studies attention. I'm interested in sort of the basic brain mechanisms of how attention works using functional MRI, ERPs, neurobehavioral results. And over the last several years, we've been interested in seeing how that basic function is perturbed, either on the negative side, meaning degradation, whether it's due to stress or um, bad mood or, or threat, um, and sort of on the enhancement side, with the tool of, of something called mindfulness meditation, which I was very pleased that we've already had one uh, recent presentation on. So let me just launch right in, because I think this quote anchors what I want to tell you, which is where the interse I see the intersection of, of wisdom research, of attention, and of mindfulness. And this is one of, probably all of you have heard it by one of our, our kind of grandfathers of modern psychology, William James, and I'll just read it the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be an education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than give practical directions for bringing this about. So what I love about this is that he sees it. He sees and, and points out that who we are as, a, as people and I would say our capacity for wisdom relies at the heart of, of things on our, on our attention. But the other thing that he seems to point out is that we really don't know what to do about this, about the fact that we have this wandering attention and it's hard to tame, right? So many, many strategies over the last few decades have been devoted to trying to figure out how to tame a wandering attention. So whether it's through medication or psychotherapy or computer-based training, um, or what I'm doing in my own lab, which is mindfulness-based methods of seeing if we can actually tame this wandering attention. And if doing so, which is the direction I'd like to go next, inspired by our conversation today, has anything to do with people cultivating and embodying these qualities of wisdom. So what's mindfulness? We talked a little bit about it with, with um, Joel, Joel's talk. And um, what I want to say is that I think that there's many different descriptions of it. And I'm going to highlight just the aspects that are, that are part of the operational landscape of the work that I do. So mindfulness, from, from my point of view or my perspective, is a mental mode characterized by attention to present moment experience without conceptual elaboration or emotional reactivity. Now, when I say this in non-academic audiences, as many of you are already showing signs of, they glaze over. And um, you guys awake? We're, the, we're almost in the home stretch to, to lunch. Um, but what I, I think I want to describe it in a way that many, mo many of you may already be familiar with is that when we talk about mindfulness training, when we talk about what mindfulness is, is that it has to do with doing something about this mi the mind's pervasive tendency to me do mental time travel. And so I put the metaphor of here, up here of a little kind of MP3 player, that our, our brains are exquisite at fast forwarding into planning, thinking about what's next, what's our to-do list, what's there gonna be for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. Our brain and mind are, are exquisite at actually going in reverse, where we're uh, ruminating and reviewing over and over again events that have not occurred. 
And when I talk about mindfulness, I'm talking about keeping that button right on play, about this capacity to experience the unfolding of moment to moment experience with awareness and uh, with, with an attentional stance that's oriented toward knowledge of what's happening and experience of what's happening here and now. Does that, does that help? Okay, so when we talk about mindfulness and in that way, I think it is good to go kind of under the hood. As somebody was asking, like, what's the, what are the components of these programs? And a lot of the work that I've, I'm, I'm going to be sharing, well, that I've done and that I'll share with you in part today, use a, uh, a, a training program that comes from the wisdom traditions, comes from a mindfulness meditation a la uh, Buddhism, uh, called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And this has been studied for over maybe 25 years with, with dozens, actually probably over 70 or so, uh, clinical NIH-supported uh, trials. This is a foundational exercise in mindfulness of breathing. And I want to review it with you just so you get a sense of what, our hypo what drives our hypotheses. So the instruction, and I would say it is quite simple, but foundational, not easy. Uh, sit in a comfortable, upright, and alert posture. Focus all of your attention to the sensations of breathing. Easy enough. Now, the key in is that you select something very specific on which to attend, whether it's the coolness of air moving in and out of your nostrils or your belly coming in and out. It's a very specific selection. And that's where I think we're honing in on this aspect of selective attention. The second part of the instruction is essentially for the formal period of time that you're going to do this practice, maintain your focus there. So this is where I would say it's very much tied to working memory or the ability to hold and manipulate information over short periods of time. You're selecting it and maintaining it there. And the final part of the instruction is when your mind wanders to those sensations, topics, thoughts, whatever it is that doesn't have to do with this formal intention to focus on sensations of breathing, just gently return it back. So within just this foundational exercise, we see that selecting or selective attention, maintaining or working memory, and curbing or, or controlling our mind wandering as well as awareness of it are key aspects of what the under the hood foundational practice is training. So our, 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 our hypotheses were really around whether we would see formal changes out of the kind of toolkit we have of cognitive neuroscience indices of attention, working memory, and mind wandering to see those. And um, essentially what I'll tell you is that the evidence looks quite good. And most of these studies are done with uh, pre-post designs where we're using standard measures of attention and working memory. And they are intended to see if there are changes above and beyond uh, a control condition and in many cases an active comparison condition, just like the project that, that you guys just described. So that's kind of the good news. The one thing that I wanted to kind of hone in on a little bit is to say something about this last feature. So there's Attention, working memory, mind wandering. And mind wandering is probably the newer area within uh, contemplative neuroscience uh, investigations of mindfulness training that we're getting into. And when I say mind wandering here, I'm talking about this very specific tendency to have off-task thoughts during an ongoing task or activity. So it's not essentially daydreaming where you might allow yourself the conscious free flow of thoughts, but it actually is when you're trying to do something, you're not there. And a lot of times this is, this is corresponding with difficulty performing tasks. And for those of us uh, and many populations that we study are in this position, where you, if you are not in the here and the now, if you are not focusing on the task at hand, there are going to be dire consequences. Um, it's very important that we might figure out ways or strategies by with which we could help people tame their own mind wandering. Um, so that's what I wanted to just share with you in terms of an empirical snapshot of the work that we've been doing lately. And you know, most of my work is in high stress cohorts. So there is a real cost of not having your attention in the here and the now. Um, but we don't know of a good ways what we until now have had very difficult challenge, just like William James said, of getting people to figure out ways to train themselves to be better able to do this. So our basic question was, can mindfulness training curb mind wandering? And the way we did this is we, you know, we had to essentially promote mind wandering in the lab, um, which is kind of tricky because you're asking people to come in and then not do what you asked them to do, um, and then be able to index performance associated with it. Uh, what we realized we could do to promote mind wandering is just bore them. 
So we designed the world's most, or we used the world's most boring task, the sustained attention response task, uh, which just requires paying attention to the screen, pressing a button every time you see a number appear and withhold the response when that number is three. And we looked at their performance. How well were they at withholding that response when they shouldn't have pressed the button? And we looked at this in the context, uh, what I like to share with you is just th the study we did in undergraduates. Uh, and we, we, we timed our project so that we had a seven week training program that ended essentially right around the start of final season. So our prediction going in, given the full literature on the costs of the academic semester on psychological well-being in students is that they were gonna be more stressed and that maybe their attention would actually be compromised because of this. And what we found was indeed that that was the case. Their performance on this task and, and others um, was not as good at the end of the seven week period, period relative to the beginning of it in the group that got nothing at all. In the group that participated in the seven week program, and just to say a word about that program, what it required was that once a week, they'd come and meet with the group for 20 minutes, but two other times that same week, they would come in and do the exercises proctored by us in, our, in my laboratory. And these were very similar to the kind of exercises that are part of standard mindfulness uh, programs. So mindfulness of breathing, a body scan, et cetera. So the interesting thing here was that the kind of normative uh, problems that we saw were that there was a decline in attention, but that engaging in this program tended to keep people protected against that and actually increase above their beginning levels. Um, and what I thought was interesting is that they reported phenomenologically in the per first person subjective sense that they were more on task as they were doing this experiment. We've gone on to, I know my, my time's basically up, uh, we've gone on to look at this in a whole host of other high stress cohorts. We just published a paper recently in active duty military. We're doing this with military spouses, uh, with uh, elite athletes uh, in the workplace setting. And we're essentially we're triangulating on the same thing, which is that in a high stress situation, attention is very fragile, it gets depleted, mind wandering increases, but that providing people these sort of portable, uh, self-sustaining practices seems to protect against that. So I just want to end by saying that what we found so far with our work is that mindfulness training seems to improve attention, curb mind wandering, but you need to be doing it in an ongoing fashion to maintain benefits. So if you actually stop practicing, you go back to the way things were. And while more research is needed, we really do think that mindfulness training is a, a successful strategy by which to promote and strengthen attention. And I hope that you know, with the continued engagement with this group, uh, we might be able to further investigate what impact that has uh, in terms of wisdom and the relationship between stronger attention and wisdom. So thank you for your attention. I really like how you separated sort of mind wandering from daydreaming because I know there's been some recent research that's shown that actually some mind wandering can be beneficial. So, I'm, so I guess I'm kind of wondering why does mindfulness meditation only seem to reduce mind wandering but not daydreaming and could there be some sort of negative effects maybe to having too much control over your attention? I think that, yeah, I think that basically the, the news is that when you track people when they're supposed to do a task uh, and you look at the impact of mind wandering, deleterious consequences, things aren't going so well. Um, but that when you actively allow or track people's willful engagement in what, you know, psychology speak, constructive internal reflection, there are benefits, better insight problem solving, positive visioning, creative thinking, et cetera. Um, what, what I would say hasn't been done well is looking at how much more daydreaming might be happening as a function of of mindfulness training. Uh, we know that things like insight problem solving seems to be facilitated by people engaging in, in mindfulness training. So it's not so much, I'm showing you one side of the problem space because my interest is in groups that are high stress for whom it's definitely not a good idea. You know, if you're, if you're on patrol somewhere and in the middle of Afghanistan or Iraq, you wanna have your attention fully on the task at hand. Um, so the downside is that, you know, that would happen, mind wandering happening there would be devastating. I think that the full studies need to look at the consequences in, in other contexts. Thanks. I actually had exactly the same question as Mark, uh, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but uh, I, I offer a, a um, prediction for your future studies that are gonna also look at wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, I bet, uh, I guess this is recorded, um, 
I bet that uh, that it might actually be exactly what he suggested that that the method of uh, the here and now might get people to be much more effective, but show a little less wisdom. Oh, okay. So I'll take. I'll here's take a that. prediction. I'll take that a hypothesis. The follow-up I have is, a, is kind of a so okay. is kind of a, a follow-up in the sense that in a selective attention task, you have given them um, a target which they already can monitor for. Mm -hmm. In many kinds of tasks where you want to use selective attention, you may not know in advance exactly mm -hmm. what you're monitoring for. And so I'm wondering in follow-up, so in, in insight, you often want to draw from outside. But even more than that, in a focused attention task where you don't know what the target is, it fits a category rather than a particular exemplar. And different kinds of exemplars might come up that create a little bit more demand for conceptual elaboration, which your method specifically um, gets people to not do. And so I'm wondering if you would, in those kinds of uh, tasks find a different pattern? That's a great question. And actually, it relates to the comment that you had around predicting less wisdom. Uh -huh. um, because if you think about it, mindfulness meditation is part of the world's wisdom traditions, right? So, so that is a strong counter hypothesis. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say that ties to your point is that in addition to this emphasis that I definitely emphasize in this brief talk on concentrative focus, improving a selective, maintained focus, another entire aspect of mindfulness training, and in, in some ways I would say a key aspect of mindfulness training, is another feature uh, uh, that is um, trained called open monitoring. In this case, the, in, in, the instruction is to hold the focus on this object in case you really need it, but really to instead keep the mind sort of like a vast open sky and allow thoughts, feelings, sensations to pass through them without engaging in them to make sense of them. Okay, so both of those paired together, I think, give a more complete picture. It ends up that novices have a very hard time learning this uh, and tend to get lost in mind wandering if you ask them to do it. When we look at the more seasoned practitioners that are able to do this, and we bring them to the laboratory and give them a more expansive repertoire of attention tasks in which we don't tell them what the target is, or in the case of a 2007 paper I did, we don't tell them where the target might even appear in the visual field. We find that more experienced practitioners who have spent more time engaging in this open monitoring practice are better able to just quickly and efficiently detect it with no uh, readying of where to look. So I think that those are, I mean, I thank you for, I appreciate you saying that because um, I'm pretty much emphasizing what we tend to see in novices, but there is this more uh, robust repertoire of what they do and what they, what they develop. Here, um, can you go back to the results of the, sure. of the article? My question uh, has... Oh, where was it? You wanted to see just the graph? Uh, the number. See, the, the graph, the graph. My question is related to um, how large the effects are. Oh, the effects are small to medium in this study. And I would say if all I could do is tell you about one study, I would probably not be willing to stand up here. Um, and also, remember, the study that I uh, described was relative to an active... Uh, and, and just a control condition, okay? So if we amass uh, across studies and now these meta-analyses are being done, I think we're getting a more uh, uh, complete picture of where we're seeing effects versus not. So in short form training, we tend to see modest effect sizes, significant group by time interactions and significant increases over time for the treatment group. But um, what we're seeing is that short form training doesn't hit all the targets. If you have more elaborated training, for example, for example, in the study that I just showed, we saw working memory didn't change. We saw that, that mind wandering was reduced, but working memory didn't improve. If you give them double the number of, of uh, hours of practice, you find that now working memory does seem to, to improve. So, I mean, I think it, there's a lot of open questions, but uh, essentially we're triangulating on the need for a lot of individual practice uh, sufficient emphasis on practice during the intervention itself uh, to see tractable benefits. The, the question is whether the effort is worth, because you, the, the phenomenon there was a 4% accuracy. That's significant in the context of a target. I understand the significance, target. but it's a yeah. 4%. Uh, so if I have to do a lot of work for that, you know, 
okay. at the end of the day, it means that I'll miss one target. That's well, I think that the, the proof is going to be in the pudding. When people do these experiment, uh, do these, do these kinds of trainings and say that not only does it do things like change their life, uh, allow their relationships to be saved, uh, give them peace of mind and sanity when they're on the side of a hilltop in Afghanistan, for example, um, we can look into, in terms of academic achievement and see does taking this kind of a course change test scores? And so far for things like math, it does seem to in a significant fashion that, that school districts tend to care about. So I think you're right. I mean, with this kind of task, one, showing you one experiment and finding 4%, you might not be convinced. But now the larger enterprise of seeing real world application uh, has to happen and is happening. So related to the idea that um, meditation could have potential negative effects on wisdom, so there is some research on future and present self. So the idea that um, the decisions you make for your present self might not be best for your future self. And also a disconnectedness between present and future selves may lead to unethical decisions because um, you don't feel the consequences as, as much. So. What do you think is the effects of mindfulness on present and future selves, and would it have any implications on wisdom? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't, but I also think that's why it's interesting to be here. I mean, I think maybe I'm one of the few researchers whose work is not affiliated in any formal way, but these are exactly the directions we want to look at, right? So even asking the more basic question around what does mindfulness training do with people's sense of future and past self? is something that hasn't been fully explored. It's just not an area within this research that people have been looking at. And then to further tie it to how it's, it's corresponding to wisdom is, is open. Thanks. Thank you. I actually had two questions, one of which I think was partially answered by your description of open monitoring. Yeah. And uh, I was going to bring up the distinction between focus and awareness, mm -hmm. uh, where you have a focus, a cognitive focus on a particular point in a, in a larger field of which you need to be aware. And the awareness is not only cognitive, the awareness is going to have to be sensory. Uh, so, you know, in places like Afghanistan, for example, the soldiers have to be aware mm -hmm. of uh, what's going on in their environment, and part of that is going to require some sort of sensory awareness. So that's question number one. I wonder if you could elaborate on the sensory dimensions of mindfulness training a little bit. And the second question is about interest. And I think this is probably related to the present and future self question. And that is, I wonder if there is a difference in the success rates uh, among research participants who might have an interest in addition to, it on a, in a certain subject area, in addition to their mindfulness training that helps them with attention. So I might have an attentional problem, but I might also have an interest in becoming good at math or becoming better at math. And is there, is there a better performance rate on those tasks, uh, when those subjects than in people who just don't have the interest in improving in the subject area? All right. Uh, I don't really have anything to add to your, I think it's a great question, the second one, regarding interest. I don't know if anybody that's actually looked at that. And you know, this is a very nascent field, so I think that would be another direction to go, is how does it align with intrinsic, the intrinsic orientation of the participant? Because the interest could be broad. In the context of academic achievement, it may be on the subject matter, but it could be in life, do you care about preserving your relationship? Do you want to have better communication with your, you know, your boss or your subordinate, that kind of thing? So I think that's a very important um, relationship to look at. For the first question, yes, there is now um, starting to be some uh, evidence. I mean, all of the things that I talked about where we're using these kind of behavioral performance measures, um, a parallel set of studies would be looking at core neural or perceptual uh, markers. Um, and so far, it looks like those, are, those seem to be sensitive as well. So if you have people that are engaging in these more focused attention type mindfulness practices, um, their core perceptual ability, at least the cost associated with mind wandering would be reduced. I think we are out of time now. Thanks. Thanks.